All right, I think we'll get started. If everybody's all set for the last session, I'm all that's between you and a happy hour somewhere. So I'll try to keep it uh, entertaining. It'll be, uh, I typically move fast in my presentations, and so if you want me to slow down or stop, please raise your hand. Um, otherwise, I've, I've pretty much packed this with material. Um, we've got about 30 slides to go to, so so that's, you know, we can fill an hour with 30 slides. Um, but if you have questions on anything at any time, raise your hand, interrupt, um, anything you'd like, and we'll we'll talk it through. So um, with that, my name is Mark Rawls. I'm the VP of Business Analytics at SolarWinds, um, and this presentation is there's a tab for that, uh, which is what we typically tell people when they're like, hey, you know, it'd be really nice if we knew this. And it's like, hey, did you know there's already a tab for that? Uh, so some quick background. So I, so again, I lead the analytics team at SolarWinds. We are a provider of IT management software. We're not green energy, um, despite the name. We were founded by a couple of guys who really liked science fiction and thought SolarWinds sounded cool. Uh, I've got 17 people on my team. We have uh, you know, web analysts, marketing analysts, Salesforce administrators, and then the FP&A team falls under me as well. Um, we've got 10,000 plus customers, the number's way higher, but I didn't know what I'm actually officially allowed to share, so I pulled this all just straight out of publicly available sources so I can't get in trouble with legal. Uh, 1,400 plus employees, and, and according to Yahoo Finance, 382 million, I think, in annual revenue for a trillion 12 months. So just to give you a sense of the kind of size and, size and scope, uh, we've been using Tableau now for a year. We just renewed about four days ago. Uh, we have an eight-core server license. We did that so we could have unlimited users. Uh, we didn't want to be restricted as we did that. Um, we have 21 Tableau desktop licenses, which basically covers most of my team. And then we kind of we give out loaners uh, to teams basically so that they can self-serve and build some of their own. Uh, the way we're staffed is really kind of a, a teach them to fish um, analytics model where we try to provide the data, provide the reports, and and have a lot of user involvement. And so when we have power users out in the organization, we'll give them a license so they can create reports for their teams. Uh, we've got 400 plus uh, Tableau users across all functions, probably no more than about 30 concurrent. I actually don't know what the answer is, but I know we get about 450 views per day um, by about 60 users, so I assume no more than about half of that's concurrent in an average day. And we primarily, and in fact almost exclusively, use a Microsoft SQL based data warehouse to pull all of our data into Tableau. So uh, just to give you a sense, so that data warehouse did not exist three years ago. Uh, we started it um, kind of on a whim, didn't know what we needed, needed somewhere to put some data, started it with a contractor, hired the contractor full time, and now it's a, they, they took it away from me, now IT has to run it because it's now a mission critical application and, and they don't trust me with it um, for, for very good reason. Uh, that's a very well earned, hard earned reputation. Um, and there's two DBAs now that run that for us. So just to give you a sense of size and scope. So when thinking about uh, this presentation and you know what Tableau has been like at SolarWinds and what it's done for us, I'm a, I'm a former, I'm a recovering consultant, and so naturally I had to draw something resembling a two by two. And so if you think about time, you know, over time, what has Tableau done for us? Well, you know, I, it, to me it was about effort and impact. So we had a lot of effort that went in before we really saw a lot of impact coming out of that, and then all of a sudden it was like a flip, a switch flipped, and we started to get a lot of impact within the organization, a lot of you know, all of a sudden the amount of questions coming to us, the amount of the consumption of Tableau just skyrocketed. And so, so I think this is a useful, uh, useful way to think about, think about our adoption. And it really went in three phases, three phases. So the first phase was really the proof of concept. And I would really, to me, this was about the first two months until we signed the deal where we really proved out that Tableau could do the critical things we needed it to do. Uh, second phase was building the foundation. So it's all that heavy lifting that we had to do to really get things in place so that we could then have that, that hockey stick and impact. And that hockey stick and impact occurred when we finally got that buy-in from the organization. And I've got my email address at the end. And so if you want my slides, just shoot me an email and I'll send them to you. So let's talk proof of concept. So, uh, so, this is a, so when Nick Van Buskirk, who was our, our sales, one of our sales guys at the time, when he suggested I do this presentation, he said, and you have to include this quote, and it's, it's a good one. So on my first sales call with Nick and Daisy, I was a bit of a skeptic. And so one of the first things I said to them is, you know, I've taken a look at your website, and, you know, this pretty much looks like glorified charting software. I was like, this looks like a great front end. I don't know how this will help me do analysis. This is really, I mean, this is just pretty, pretty pictures, and, you know, I don't, I don't have that much tolerance for pretty pictures. And they said, well, you should check it out, put it through paces, come back to us and let us know if, if you're really interested, if you, if you think there's something there. Um, so I created the ugliest Tableau visualization ever. 
Uh, so what I did is I really tried to break it. I took our last three years of download data. So we have a, a download model. People come to the website, download a free trial. That, that turns into a lead, et cetera. So I took uh, three years of download data, and I, I, up, I uploaded it. And my, my computer just churned and churned trying to upload and process and columnarize and all that stuff, all this data. And I was thinking, ah, I, I've got it. I've, I've really, you know, I've, I've, I've got it on the run. And so then I dropped in about the most offensive thing I could think of, which is, I dropped in search terms for one of our, for our primary or flagship product and days across the top and then I did a count of downloads by day, right? So downloads by search term, you know, this is, you know, almost 20,000 rows by, you know, 900 columns. And then what I did, because I really wanted to be irritating, is I changed it from organic search to paid search to see how long it would calculate. And it took about three seconds. And I went, holy smokes. If I did this in Excel, I think my laptop would catch on fire. And so then, you know, the, the follow-up call, you know, wow, this is different. This is, there's something here. So we looked at, you know, we looked at a lot of um, different options. Uh, we looked at Tableau. We looked at ClickView. We looked at um, Spotfire. Um, we didn't look at any of them to the, to the level of depth that we did with Tableau, and that was just because of how easy Tableau was. So the fact that I could, you know, you know create it, I'm sorry, create this in, you know, really in the first 20 minutes of using Tableau, I could already get this far. You know, with, with some of those other pieces of software in 20 minutes, you know, I, I really couldn't make heads or tails of it. And I'm, I'm kind of a systems guy. I take pride in that, and I was a little embarrassed. Um, so, so those three criteria that I talked about. So what are the things that we had to do to make sure that Tableau would work for us and work for our organization before we moved, you know, before we really moved into a contract, before we started thinking about rollout? So the first one was a permissions model. So this is a major sticking point for us. We have a, we have a somewhat paranoid culture. In, in terms of sharing data. And so we do not like, you know, we go to great lengths to make sure that no one in the company has, or no one, say, below kind of a, a VP, SVP level has the complete picture of the company in terms of performance. And so one of the things that we need, though, is we need all these people to be able to have access to their data and know how their product's doing. And, you know, as much as I, as much as I love serving our end users, you know, if I had to take another report and slice it into 18 different versions, which is what we did every month for our month in report, um, I was going to have to shoot somebody. Um, the second thing was sites projects. So one of the things that, that you know, we weren't, um, that we needed to figure out the right way to do is how do you really group these reports and display them in a way that's really um, intuitive for your end users um, to get to the data that they need. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about how, what a, what a more or less abject failure we've been um, at doing that. Um, and then the third thing is, is a scalable process to connect to that data warehouse. So how do we make sure that we do it and that we do it in a way that we have change control, that we that we understand, okay, yesterday this, this report showed that we booked 100,000 bucks and today it only shows 90. You know, why, you know, what, did something change in the query that caused that to happen or was it just a credit memo? So those are the, those are the three things that we really wanted to get to the bottom of. So the problem around permissions, again, is that, so we have a highly matrixed organization. We have product teams, we have source teams within marketing, we have geographies. And everyone needs to have their access to the slice. So if you're running our, if you're a product marketing manager for the MSP business, you need to see MSP bookings, all sources, all geos. But if you're a marketing manager in EMEA, you need to see all products, all sources, but only EMEA. And then, of course, you know, sources kind of works the other way. And so this is something that we really beat our head against the wall. I think Tableau, I think the, the row level security is very strong. Um, but it's something that, that it's, it's very strong if you, if you have a one-dimensional filter criteria that you need to enforce. But when you get multidimensional, it gets complicated. Um, so with a complicated problem, we, we came up with a comp complicated solution. So this is our permissions filter. We have different variants of it. The, it basically comes in groups. There are certain reports that don't have, say, program type, which is marketing program. So, you know, those lines, you know, we remove those lines for the filter. Otherwise, of course, it would fail. Um, but basically, we say, okay, if you're on the analytics team or you're an executive, you can see everything. Otherwise, you know, we do our region filter. If the region is NA and you're, in a, you're a member of NA, then you get to see your data. Or if your product is database and you're a member of database, you get to see that data. Um, and then the, the one at the bottom, which, I, which is you know, kind of another important one, is around sales managers. And so this is where, you know, we don't have, we can have a sales manager who ma manages multiple sales teams. There's not always a one-to-one -one relationship. But the way the Salesforce hierarchy works, a, a manager can only have a single team, like in his user profile. And so what we, what we did is we basically, you know, into our views, we built in a field called sales manager. And for every rep, it 
says the name of their manager, and then you know if that's your name, then and that matches, then then that's your filter, right? And so that way we ensure that our sales managers can see only their reps. Sales directors we throw into the regions because you know a director can see all the NA teams, but a manager should only be able to see their reps. So that's how we built the permissions. Any questions on this? Because this this took a lot of of beating head against the wall to to figure out. We put it in, we put it at the data source level, and we only do it in certain data sources. And so, so again, we're trying to be more open and allow people. We're trying to go with a philosophy of let's not restrict it unless we have to. Um, so we put it in things like orders. We put it in like pipeline reports, those kinds of things. Areas where where it tells you something material about the business, but we don't do it in in email results. There's just no reason. Yes. That you know, that's really helpful for getting access to workbooks. But you know, the fact is that any every user in our company has access to the weekly booking weekly bookings report workbook, which is which basically lays out in just you know crystal clear clarity exactly how we're doing. But for eighty five percent of those users, they would see only a fraction of the data, if anything at all. And so we really had to control at the data source level. We don't want it's, it's a lot of trouble to maintain a list of who should have access to weekly bookings and who should not. So we solve it at the data source, which is, in my opinion, a lot more robust. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited about that permissions manager. I'm excited about a lot of things. Do you see, do you see any performance issues? I'm sure we do. I, I, we have to, right? I mean, there's no way around it. But um, And when people complain about speed, I'm like, ah, yeah, I know it's terrible that now you get daily access to data that 15 months ago you didn't get at all. I'm so I'm so sorry. It it ticks for twenty seconds. That's terrible. Um, any any more on this before we move on? But yeah, we do we do see it. We've talked to we've had uh, consulting in. Um, they've looked at it and they're like, well, you're for what you want to do. You know, this is a, a good way of doing it. Unless you want there are alternatives, but but none of the al the alternatives, in my opinion, create more problems than they solve. So a quick reminder to me to mention to all the tableau people in the room. I tease because I love. So sites, projects, and tags. So again, this is this is what our this is this is a zoomed out view of what our main reporting project looks like, and we'll talk about what we decided to do there in a minute. Um, but let's face it, this is you know far from the most intuitive and desirable user interface we've ever seen. And I'll, I'll un unfortunately hammer on this a couple times uh, in this presentation. Um, you know, we didn't we don't. We don't like, I don't like tags. We don't use tags because they're too hard. In my opinion, they're too hard to update and to consistently enforce. And so we just kind of threw tags right out the window. And so for us, it was all about, okay, what do we do? Do we do sites or do we do, we do projects in order to make the data accessible and give people a view into what they want? So quick refresher on the rules. So if you have a site, that is a stand -up, basically a standalone instance basically within Tableau. And if you have another site, those things are completely walled off from each other. So that's the first thing to understand. Within a site, you have these hierarchies, right? You have projects, you have workbooks, and you have data sources. And data sources should kind of be off to the side and not at the bottom because they don't really fall under workbooks, but that would get confusing. Uh, so I left it this way. And so we, again, each site's completely walled off from other sites. You know, your project is like, it's like a folder. It's like a, you know, we, we had this folder on our marketing share drive called Download Reporting 1. And what that had was the key Excel files that marketing should use to do their jobs. Well, now we have, you know, this is kind of, you know, these projects are kind of the equivalent of that. Um, or they could be, depending on how you implement it. And then workbooks and data sources, you know, they fall into a project. They're part of a project, but their permissions can be totally separate. Someone could not have access to the project, but have access to the data source. And that gives you a lot of flexibility, and that's where the new permissions will really, really make things handy. So what we decided to do is we went with one site for all of SolarWinds. We've got a couple of acquired companies that, that have their own sites, but SolarWinds itself has one site within Tableau. And what we did is we said, you know what, we're going to go with a reporting project because if I've got the you know, lead to opportunity conversion report, well, that's, that's a sales report, but it's also a marketing report. And so I don't want to maintain two reports that I, that I have to update every single time and keep them in concert. And if, if those things get out of whack, then that raises all sorts of problems because, because people walk into the meetings with different sets of data. So I want there to be one report. So what we said is, you know what? We're going to put all of our official reports into reporting. 
and everyone will know that's where you go to get to your reports. Those are the they're the official blessed ones. We did a a work in progress, and so that's kind of the analytics team playground. We did a user generated reports, so no no users outside the analytics team can actually save a report to reporting. They can save them to to user generated, so they can go into reporting, grab the official, and then save as over into user generated. Um, and then what we've started to migrate to a little bit when we have very distinct teams. So our support team they um, they have a uh, Tableau Power user who did a bunch of reporting there. He wanted to, to um, give baseline support reps access to that, but he didn't want those report reps spending a bunch of time kind of mucking around reporting, um, which, you know, whether I agree with that philosophically or not, you know, happy to support it. And so, so we, we were moving a little bit towards the de dedicated folders, um, but what we did was we put all of our data sources under reporting. So no matter what the data source goes to, all of our support data sources go into reporting. And the idea there is that we have a single area to manage all of our data sources, which we found to be really helpful. Uh, the single site, again, you know, given those Chinese walls between sites, we just didn't want to mess with that. Um, so the single site. Um, you know, so again, we've added projects where needed, like the, the support team, but we haven't done enough of that. We probably have a need to do a sales project with very sales-specific reports, but but again, what I'd rather do, what, I, what, I, what I'm hoping for is to basically procrastinate until, until that pretty new ver version of server comes out, and then hopefully that will solve a bunch of these problems. Um, and then finally, yeah, all data sources are managed in the, in the main reporting project. And again, that, just, that level of consolidation really helps us. Um, because what it means is that any time you add a user, uh, even if that user doesn't, like the support team, they don't get access to reporting, but they get access to data, the reporting data sources. And so it's just very consistent from a permissions perspective. Any questions on this before? Yep. So can you share data sources across sites? No. Yeah. No. So if you wanted to, yeah. So if you, so for example, we have a, we acquired a company called Pingdom uh, in Sweden recently, and we are in the process of, of building a connection between their, their database and ours um, so that we can expose, we're not going to put them on our network. Anyway, lots of detail. But, uh, but one of the things we are going to do is probably have a Pingdom site that allows their management to log in and look at just Pingdom data and their their you know product managers, et cetera. Um, but what we're going to do is just duplicate the, the data source because there's no way around it. But that's a very specific example. I wouldn't want to do that for sales and marketing and anybody else. And so so typically we don't do that. So do you primarily manage your permissions at the project level? Yes. Project level and then and then that filter. And that, that covers uh, the majority of it. All right, so the next, the next thing we wanted to solve is, okay, how do we figure out how we can really scalably and sustainably uh, connect to the data warehouse? So we get, you know, we have web visit data, we have reg form data, we have Salesforce data, we have NetSuite data, and we bring that all in through one kind of tool or another into our data warehouse. And, you know, they each have, have their representative tables. You know, there's, you know, a dozen or so Salesforce tables. There's a couple form data tables, you know, a half dozen web visit ta tables, et cetera. Um, and the question was, okay, how do we get that to Tableau and how do we do it um, in a way that works? Because what we started by doing was, was copying out our SQL script. You know, it was, it was super convenient. You could pull up the Excel file that had all your download data. It was, we were using, uh, you know, a data source connection to SQL. You edit that, copy the query, paste it into Tableau, and you're off and running. The problem is anytime you want to add a field, change a field, change the logic, Number one, once you make that change, you have no idea what was there before. Um, number two, you have to bring down the data source, make the change, and then republish it, which is, can be a hassle because some of these data sources are hundreds of megs and, um, or more. And so, so what we ended up doing is going with a, with a process that we are relatively regimented about, which is we don't ever copy and paste SQL code into Tableau. Instead, what we do is we create a view in the data source. And now our DBAs do that for us. And we name the view with a very specific naming convention, you know, VW underscore Tableau underscore whatever the thing is. And then we create a data source in Tableau that exactly matches that name. And so if you want to have a field added to, say, your asset query, you don't even have to go and look at the view. You submit a JIRA ticket to the DBA and you say, hey, view Tableau asset query needs to add target ID. That's all there is to it. And so this makes it really easy. The other thing that's really great is that our DBA team uses um, uh, source control. So every time they then iterate that, they then they have versioning. And so they can tell you very specifically what changed between any two, uh, between any view changes. And given that, I don't know, you guys may be more responsible analysts than I am, there's no freaking way I'm doing version control. 
Um, it's just not, when push comes to shove, that's the first thing I'm going to forget. And so doing this, it takes, again, that danger out of our hands. Um, it, it gives it to people who actually solve that problem the right way. And then the, easy, the ease of having those matching views makes life really easy. So it's, I thought on some level it was silly to have this slide, but this has saved us more hours of pain than probably any other single decision we've made. Any questions? We try. We try. We're not as good about that as we should. Um, right, yeah, we, tr yeah, we try to do, we, we try to shift as much work over, you know, given we have an eight core license and the, the number of users we have and the, the strain we tend to put on it doing, having, you know, text heavy visas and, and other things, we try to take as much of the processing work out of Tableau and put it on SQL as we can. We also, I'm, I'm really fortunate I have two outstanding DBAs whose names I will not divulge. And, uh, and so they, they handle this for us. Okay, so, so once we got through those three things, we, I was able to go to the CIO and say, hey, these problems are solved. We know how to do it. I also knew for myself these problems were solved. Uh, then it came into building the foundation. Uh, so as I think back about it, I think there are, and there are certainly more than three, but, but you know, I'm a consultant, so everything's in threes. Um, but there are really three, um, or it was, I mean, recovering. Um, there are really three things that I wanted to highlight. So one is analytics team buy-in. And this is something that I still, that we still struggle with. You know, if you're in this room, you're probably like me, where you get a new system and a new toy and, and you know, people couldn't, you know, keep you away from it. But not everyone on my team is like that, um, unfortunately, and, and for good reason, partially because, you know, unlike me, they have, you know, nine hours of very specific work to do every day, and I'm, if I'm asking them to learn Tableau, then, then that's now 11 hours or whatever it is to pick Tableau up on top of their work. Uh, the second thing is being cautious about migrating reports from Excel to Tableau. A lot of our early sins were we were because we took a report in, in Excel and, hey, this report has 20 tabs and it's got this embedded query and we copy paste the embedded query, we recreate the tabs and then we send it out to the world. And it takes forever to load and it's slow and it's just a big mess. Um, and then the third one is knowing where to focus your efforts. So what are, the, what are the high impact reports? How do you think about should I do report A or B first in order to, in order to build that foundation faster? So we'll get into that. So team enthusiasm for Tableau. So I, I uh, pre-sold a little bit on this one, but one, it is double work, right? I mean, it, it really is, you are adding work to their day. Every analyst who works for you, or if you're an analyst, as you pick this up, you have to get your day job done. That Excel report that took eight hours, that takes eight hours to do, you have to do that eight hours of work and try to find time to automate it in Tableau on the side. Um, and it's true, it's, it's a thing, like there's no getting around it. Um, but once you, once that report's built, then now you've gotten rid of eight hours, and now the second report you do, well now you, you've, you've just created eight hours. That second report that's also eight hours, you know, now you have plenty of time to build that in Tableau. And so it's, it builds on itself, and the fact that Tableau self-maintains is wonderful. Um, the second thing is, you know, Excel gurus, and, and again, it's some of the people who have resisted the most are the people who are the best in Excel, and it's because it's, you know, parts of Tableau, if you're in Excel, you know, an Excel Jedi, to borrow the term, parts of Tableau are just, I mean, it, you, again, you want to you bang your head against the wall. Um, and this is where what we did is we brought in Tableau Consulting for three days to do, not only to help us with, with some of these other things, but also just to train the team and to train, it, train the team on our data. And so we assigned everyone homework they, they were going to have to present out to the entire team of viz that they'd built that was something that would be part of, you know, part of what they do as their day job and went through three days of a relatively somewhat structured training. And as part of that, they all got one-on-one -on -one time with a consultant to work on their specific, specific visualization. And at the end of it, they reported out. And that, we, that was the single biggest difference. We probably needed to do it two or three times based on, on the issues we still have. But that, that was a huge help. So I think that's, and I'm not, I'm not shilling for Tableau other than it, it worked on that one. Um, the third one is data quality. So, you know, one of the nice things, you know, for the team that does, you know, you're doing a dump out of NetSuite and you've done this, you've done this every week or every month for the last two years, you know exactly where the, where the gotchas are on the data. But when you just have this kind of nebulous data source that's sitting in Tableau that is a, where there is a data dump from NetSuite down into SQL and then a SQL, you know, query written upon that that then delivers the data to Tableau, you know, if that, if your numbers don't match to the penny, because again, I manage FP&A, they, that's a huge sticking point for them, right? It's like, no, it should, 
it should match exactly. It should always match exactly. And the way to figure out why it doesn't is to audit row by row and figure out why it doesn't match exactly. And back to point number one, that's, that's a painful exercise. Um, but, but you have to do it. It's just it's the cost of doing business. And once you get that done and once you have that level of trust, then again, it, it opens everything up. Um, and then the, finally, the third one, I think, or the fourth one, rather, is, is just it's inertia, right? It's natural. You know, people somewhat are skeptical of change. And the current process is working. You know, we've, we have this set of reports. We've always pulled them. People seem happy. And, you know, there is always more to do. There's always more you can do. Every team has to scale. And, you know, it's, and there's always the, okay, well, what if I wanted to know that by geo? Oh, okay, well, that, yeah, we'd have to do an additional report for that. Okay, well, then let's get in Tableau because that will help. And I think also... You know, particularly for younger analysts, it's you know, it's very easy to make the case that you are making yourself much more marketable as a person. Not that I like to to advertise to them that they could probably get you know perhaps get paid more elsewhere if they learn to do this. But but at the end of the day, if it gets adoption, um, I'll I'll uh, I'll solve today's problem. So Tableau is not Excel. It's better. Um, it's true. Um, but there's some particular watchouts that we found. So so as a source of data. You know, one of the things that we found is that marketing managers were saying, okay, well, I use, I take that 19 tab Excel report and I use that to just extract the data I need to make the report that I want. And so they're just, you know, they're just trained that they have to do this. And, and one of the things we have to tell them is, well, yeah, but you're doing that all the time. You're doing that constantly. Give us your report and we'll just create it. Like once I have the data source, once I have the data clean, creating an additional tab that does whatever it is that you do, that's not a problem for me. Like that's, you know, you're talking two hours of work, but we almost had to force users, send us your reports, walk us through the, you know, what, send us the PowerPoint you walk through with your boss, and then we will just magically create that for Tableau and you never have to do it again. But it was a huge, we had, I mean, if I had delivered this three months ago, I would have said we probably have, you know, we probably have a significant portion of marketing still using Excel even though Tableau exists. Um, but one of the big effort we made here to, okay, show us your report, show us how it's done, we were able to eliminate a lot of that. Um, you know, another thing, and this, this affects the analyst team as well, comparing disparate data. Well, I just copy and paste, you know, lead, lead counts, opportunity counts, I get conversion. In Tableau, that's such a hassle. Um, and it's like, yeah, you can do that. You can very quickly do that. You're doing it hundreds of times a month. You're doing it constantly. Stop doing that to yourself. Instead, what we did in Tableau was we created high-quality data sources that blend at the source level. So again, we try to stay away from blending as a general rule, except in small data sets when it comes to Tableau Server. But so what we do is we create we create um, you know innovative views. I, I, that's a good word, innovative. Um, some people will call some DBAs will probably call them abominations, but. We have, a, we have a view, for example, of our lead to op data. This is a good example. Actually, we have download, long story short, but we have download to, to op. Their leads are, are kind of a funny thing in Salesforce. But what that means is that it's a union query where the, the top you know, 30,000 rows returned are all downloads. The bottom 10,000 are all opportunities. And even though some of those downloads relate to some of those opportunities, they're not in the same row. You've got the top of that report is, is download down on the left and null values on the right. The bottom report is null values on the left. Bottom of the, of the view of the data source is null values on the left, opportunity data on the right. But what that allows you to do is now you have a single, now you have a single set of data where if you want to do, you know, lead to op conversion by country, by week, by rep, by whatever it is that you want to do, you've got the data to do that all in one report because your lead, your downloads are there and your opportunities are there. And so again, it's it's a it's a hideous probably misuse of, of, of SQL from a, from a purist perspective. But Tableau, when you give it, you know, when you give it data you know, straight down in a, in, a, in a row like that, I mean, it, you know, it's, it's awesome. That's what it's there for. Um, and then finally, to visualize performance. So I don't need fancy charts. Just give me the data. Again, this is something that we heard you know, over and over and over again. You know, most of our Excel workbooks were, were long on tables and short on graphs, and, and people thought that was fine. Um, but then the first time that you show them that, hey, here's, here's your support case data by quarter, by product for the last four years, and you can slice it and dice it any way you want, and they're like, oh my gosh. Like they couldn't imagine you know, the, the, the effort to, to imagine in your mind the, the pivot table you'd create in Excel to do that. You know, is, is mind-boggling, and Tableau just does it. And so, some of what we had to do was just show people. Um, and yes, I know you say you want the data. I know you say you just want the numbers, but 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 look at this. And sometimes we created both, and then and they were like, yeah, 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 get rid of the numbers. That's not helpful to me. 
so finally, on the building the foundation stage, so, so nowhere to focus. Um, you know, four criteria for the do these first reports. And again, these were the reports that really, you know, the, these are, when we started focusing on these, on these topics, these were the reports that really motivated, or that really got people into Tableau and into using Tableau. And again, one of them was we can, instead of, we can create one report, we can use the data source filter, and now we don't have to do 18 slices, right? That was a, that was a very, that was a happy day. Um, the second thing was, you know, we've got users who manually pull data and spend four hours creating a report. Well, if you can take, if you can give them back four hours, that's enormously valuable. That will create a tremendous amount of buy-in. Now, you have to prove that the data matches, right? You've got to run it in parallel. But, you know, the reports that really, you know, that people, you know, just spend a ton of time doing today, um, when you can just take that time away from them, they will, they will become uh, Tableau adopters and evangelists for you um, very, very quickly. Um, another one is, is a report that's, say, weekly or it's monthly or it's quarterly, and there is value in doing it daily. There's a lot of reports where that's not true, right, where there's not value in doing it daily. But those reports that people hang, you know, are on the edge of their seat to know, wow, what was my attach rate between these two products? And, oh, I can't get that report till the 8th because that's when it comes out every month. You know, those are the reports that, no, 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 now you can track it every single day and see every single day how that's, how that's trending and where you're going to come out. And now, you know, on the 29th of the month or the 30th of the month, you know, you know pretty much where you're going to be. Um, and you're, you can already start your marketing plan or your, you know, whatever it is that you need to do. You know, now those are reports that also get people, you know, really excited. And again, create, create engagement, create evangelism. Um, and then finally, um, and this is, for us, this was the kicker, uh, is the report difficult or impossible to generate in the native system? So Salesforce is like the ultimate whipping boy when it comes to this because Salesforce reporting is, is very good for what it is, um, but it's lousy. And so, so one of the things that we had always tried to understand and our, um, our, they had basically given up was, okay, your sale, you know, sales team X had 10 million in open pipe uh, that was going to close this quarter last Friday. They created 200 million. They closed 150 million, and now they only have 800k. What the heck happened? Like that does those numbers don't add up? And it's because you know close dates change. You know ops get written off, et cetera, et cetera. And really, the big one is close date changes. But with um, in Salesforce, there's no way unless you wanted to go line by line through your opportunities and 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 review each individual opportunity. There'd be no way to know that. So what we did is we built, we used, um, and I'll, I'm actually uh, jumping ahead again, but but I'll I'll say it now and save us time later. Um, we we used the opportunity history table in Salesforce and and some uh, creative uh, query writing, this creative in the good sense, the DBA sort of proof of this one, um, to basically create a query that takes in parameters and will return back the stage and the value um, at a at kind of at the start of the period and then at the end of the period or the current value. So what this allows you to do is grab for every opportunity, no snapshotting um, required, for every opportunity we know, okay, here's, here's every op that changed between you know, the start of the week and today or the start of the month and today. And so now it's very easy to understand, you know, exactly what changed. And that, that allows you to get your down funnel metrics, your up funnel, you know, here's what moved down funnel, here's what moved up funnel, here's where the size of the op increased or the size of the op decreased. You can get all that reporting. That, that, was, that was just, that was literally impossible to do um, in a scalable way pr prior to Tableau. And even if you could do it in a scalable way, trying to drill down and understand at the op level, trying to pick out those specific ops uh, was just very hard. And so that was, you know, that, that really got the attention of our, of our head of sales. And that, that was probably, you know, again, one of, the, one of the biggest factors in our success, at least in terms of driving adoption. Any questions? Straightforward? Okay, so earning buy-in from the org. So, so you know, what are the, what are the important parts uh, of earning that buy-in in, in order to drive that adoption. So one, and this is obvious, right? Communicate, communicate, communicate. Uh, two, make it easy. So make it easy for the users. Um, you know, all of the kind of little tips and tricks that, you know, if you're the person who first downloaded the Tableau trial, all the things that you learned the hard way, there's no reason to make every user in your organization learn that the hard way. Um, solve a real pain point early. That kind of relates back to what we were just talking about. And then be structured in report creation. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. 
So key elements to communicate. So, so the first one that, that was huge in our organization and, and presumably in yours was timing. So who was going to get access? When, they, when were they going to get access? What was going to be in Tableau? People were just dying to know. And the longer we waited before really spelling that out, the more, uh, the, the more frankly, we just got bothered with questions until we finally wised up. Um, so that'll just save you time to, to go forward with that. Although more than anyone, I hate committing to deadlines, and so we were always like, "Oh, it's Q two ish," you know. But at least people then knew uh, there was timing. Um, uh, roadmap for report creation, right? That was the second one. We talked them through. Here, here's what we're going to do first. Here's what we're going to do second. Here are the teams that are going to get, you know, their reports first and their reports second. That helped a lot. And then finally, you know, the number one question people asked was, uh, "What's the? When are you taking away my Excel reports?" And what we did is we maintained them and. We probably now could kill uh, everything. We've killed a few things, but but kind of the gold standard download reporting file that uh, that our marketing team relied on every day, it still gets updated daily um, in Excel, which is which is awful, but it does. Um, so then uh, potential. Um, what we really stressed over and over to people was don't ask what Tableau can do that existing reports can also do. Um, ask for what you need. Right, and so one of the things that I stressed to people was, was if you ever find yourself thinking, man, it's too bad that we can't know X because it's impossible, R stop what you're doing, walk straight to my office and tell me the problem. Um, we stressed that over and over again. Many of our best reports, including that pipe change report, came out of me overhearing in the hallway or someone on my team overhearing in the hallway, man, if only we knew X. And that's, that's really the high value reports. And so you really have to stress to people, over and over and over again because they're they're so accustomed to oh well you know we can't get um, you know downloads by shoe size it's just impossible and it's like no 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 with Tableau now I mean not that one but you can um, so especially if it's impossible today those are the first things you want to ask and again and, and that's you know there's kind of a corollary to this which is which is the topic of a different discussion on being a good analyst but but the corollary to this is is you know you can't listen to what your your end users are asking for you have to you have to watch what they're doing with the data and then give them reports that allow them to do that better. Um, sure, you can take what they're asking for as a starting point, but um, but almost always you can come to a better solution if you uh, really think about how they're using the data and what they're doing with it. Um, and then finally, training, and, and I'll get into this in the following slides. But you know how to navigate to the data that you need. Um, how should you change your process to make the most of Tableau? Again, you used to extract this data, put it in a Excel. Used to copy this stuff out of a one Excel file into another Excel file, create a, a chart, and slap that in PowerPoint. Okay, don't do that anymore. You know, do this in Tableau. Um, and then finally, tips and tricks to, to minimize the transition pain. So another reminder: I tease because I care. So make it easy to adopt. Slide one of three. So the first thing is is try to deobfuscate the server interface, and I'll give some really some of my favorite examples. So despite logic. You can't add favorites by clicking the little star button that means favorites. No, you have to click this tiny little shaded out star, right? That, that takes forever to, to grasp for people. Um, here's another good one. So one of the single most useful features in all of Tableau is represented by an icon that's four pixels tall, right? It's all the way to the far right-hand side of the screen. So another good thing to educate people on. Um, this, is, this is a more understandable one. But if, if data and cross-tab are grayed out, then you've got to click somewhere in that viz because you've got multiple underlying views that are in one dashboard, and you've got to tell Tableau what it is that you actually want. But the follow-up question is, why are you using uh, export data and cross-tab? Um, and then finally, um, if you don't like clicking next 30 times to get to the report that you want, because uh, I don't, then type in 999, hit enter. It will stay perpetually. It's the most wonderful thing ever. Um, now, apparently, this new scroll feature will do the same thing, but uh, 999 in the, in the meantime uh, works just fine. Uh, okay, so to be more reasonable, um, second thing about make it easy to adopt. So one of the things that, that, we, that we hit on actually really just recently was to preemptively create custom views, especially for our international teams. Our, our Tableau server is physically located in Austin, and so that was a big issue um, for our teams in Australia and Ireland, not just because of the, the, just the, the lag time, but also just because they are, you know, we typically, it seems, under with our offices, and so, um, or at least our remote offices. And so they would have a huge time 
configuring the report, then they step away for a minute, they come back, um, you know, Tableau has taken the report out of memory and so now it refreshes and it goes back to the original filters and they hate you. Um, so one of the things we do is now we will go in and create you know, hey, you know, I know that our person in APAC needs to see these four teams. We will customize their reports with those four teams. Remember my changes on that view. You know, go in and edit that custom view and share it. And then that way, uh, now they have at their fingertips exactly what they need from the start. Uh, the other thing we've done, which has been really helpful, is to create a help tab with instructions. So we don't always do this, and we've experimented doing it in a couple different ways. Um, but the, the example here, the very first tab in the visualization, says help. It's got um, an image of the report that's been, that image has been imported and it's got arrows and everything about, hey, do this first, then do this, then do this. And that's a lifesaver for us, right? I mean, we don't, we don't do anything that's not out of self-interest. Um, this, this is probably, you know, a, another, you know, kind of top five time-saving feature for our team in terms of getting time back, especially with those remote teams. Um, and then, so find a final uh, loving dig. Um, try to find a way to solve the the report organization problem, we still have not solved it. Uh, my sales VP would rather use um, a folder called Tableau that he copies emails into when we email him and say, here's the latest version of this report. And then he goes and finds the emails that have that same link and deletes those to make sure that he doesn't get confused, um, rather than use you know, server to organize his reports. And so if you come up with a better solution, uh, please tell me because we still um, are awful at this. So biggest pain points. So again, you know, to drive that adoption and really to drive that impact, we figured out what are the things that, that each organization really needs that's really gonna, going to, to move the needle to them, for them and to give them something they didn't have before. Uh, so again, marketing. They weren't allowed to see bookings before. Now they are because each of them only gets their bookings. Um, they couldn't, you know, we could give them some basic slices of their marketing metrics, but if you wanted it by country, um, you know, by marketing source, by, you know, if you wanted to slice this thing 18 different ways, that, that was not something that we were, you know, real willing to support um, on a frequent basis. Now Tableau does it for them automatically. Uh, sales, we talked about the, the change in pipe values. And product management, again, it's, it's those reports that before they got monthly and now they have every single day, and now they have all the history in the world uh, or in our systems, rather than having, hey, here's the latest version of that that goes back 18 months, and then you know next month you'll lose a month. And so if you want to see three years of data, you've got to pull up multiple Excel files. Um, now they have all of that, they have it every day, and they have all the history they need. And they've got a lot more, I mean, there's a lot of innovative stuff that you can do with sets um, that allows you to understand, okay, how many of the people who bought product C uh, last quarter already own products A and B? And Tableau makes a lot of that analysis really you know, kind of stupid easy um, once you understand sets, uh, which is not stupid easy. Um, and whereas in Excel, I mean, that stuff's impossible. Um, so that was a that was a big uh, a big thing. Um, and then um, each report, in my opinion, should fit really one of three types. It should probably say four types because dashboards on their own are kind of a separate thing. Um, but what we've really started to focus on is. Look, you've got a daily, weekly, monthly, whatever the, the appropriate time frame is, report that gives actionable and succinct data on the current state. So we just built a report for sales that gives them, okay, for yesterday, in one kind of report left to right, yesterday, week to date, month to date, quarter to date, here's how many leads each of your reps received. Here's how many emails they sent to those leads. Here's how many opportunities they created. Here's how many, you know, this, that, and the other going all the way down. And the idea is this is the report that that sales manager, as he's walking from the garage to the office is able to just scroll through on his phone, you know, receive it every day at 6 a.m. and know exactly, you know, does he have something to worry about? You know, is there some rep who didn't send any emails yesterday or who did not convert any leads or, or whatever it is? He has that instantly. Now, it doesn't tell him why that might be the case. It just tells him it is, or her, sorry. Um, and, you know, same thing with web teams. There's, there's a lot of applications of this. And the idea is, is, you know, if you try to create the report that tells them, that alerts them there may be a problem and tells them exactly what the problem is, you're gonna have you know, 15 tabs in this ginormous spreadsheet that's, or this ginormous uh, viz that's terrible to maintain. But if you focus on, hey, this is just, this is your daily digest. All it tells you is, should I be worried or not? And if I should be worried, what should I be worried about? Then it gets you number two, which is kind of like a dashboard, but not the way I think of it, which is why I think kind of I need four types, but the soup to nut reports that, that cover an entire process. And so, okay, great. I saw that this rep didn't, con you know, this rep hasn't converted a single lead to an op this week. 
Well, I'm able to go in and look at his leads and say, hey, he got a bunch of leads from, from Gmail addresses and poor quality sources. And, and so you know what? That, I may have a problem with lead routing, um, but, I don't have a, uh, but I don't have an issue. You know, this rep may not actually be the problem. Or, or on the other hand, you know, some rep that looks like he's converting like crazy, well, it's, he should be because he's gotten 40% of his downloads this week just happen to be from existing customers. So yeah, you should be converting like crazy. In fact, why aren't you converting higher? Because um, that's that's the that's that's the mantra at, at SolarWinds, um, and so again you have these soup to nuts reports, and then the third one is is special purpose reports. And again, I feel like when you if you try to blend these things, you wind up with these these really massive reports that that don't do any one of these things well, and you're better off uh, with multiple versions. So the special perform purpose reports, you know, this may be a, a specific process or niche that doesn't really fall into the overall business flow. It may be something around, you know, I use the example here, e-commerce performance. So e-commerce is, you can filter a bunch of our reports for e-commerce and just e-commerce data, but there are some very specific things about e-commerce that you would want to see in a report. There's no reason to take a, you know, an entire process report and have this crazy drill down on the side about e-commerce. Just create a create a, a deep dive report, a special purpose report just for that. And so what we've, what we've found, and, and really this is a recent shift for us, but again, we were able to create much more useful, more actionable reports when we fit them in these silos. Um, and when we think about, you know, if you can't instantly answer and know, okay, yeah, this is a, this is a daily digest report or this is, a, this is a, you know, process deep dive report, if you, don't, if you look at a report and you're like, well, it's kind of one, it's kind of the other, okay, fail. Right, start over, separate them out. Um, I think I think your users will be much more happy because the other thing about it is is when you think about the report you want to scroll through on your phone as you walk in the office, that report does not look anything like a dashboard, right? It just it's just physically formatted separately uh, in a different way. And so by splitting them up, we find that that our users get a lot more value because the other thing is you don't want you, you know the last thing you want is your sales manager who comes in and spends two hours pouring through reports first thing of the day. Just give him what he needs to know, alert him to the problem or her, and then they can go and address that specific problem instead of you know, flipping through every single rep or flipping through whatever they need to see. So final thoughts. Um, so you know, over the last 53 weeks, we have, we have absolutely fundamentally changed the amount and the quality of the data that, that people within SolarWinds are, are able to use to make decisions. You know, we have one version of the truth. It's universally accessible. Um, and people spend less time pulling data and more time understanding it, right? It's, it's been a, um, you know, it's, it's really been phenomenal. Um, you know, there are lots and lots of ways that, that our implementation could have gone better. I've mentioned, um, you know, many of them, but, but certainly not all. And, you know, uh, Dustin, Dustin suggested I have some, you know, you know, really pithy, wise thing to say about, about you know, what, what are the really, you know, what's the one takeaway you should have? And, and um, I guess I'm a little cynical, but there's no silver bullet. I mean, it's just you got to think through each one of these decisions. You have to think about the process as a whole. You have to think about your end users and how you know sophisticated they are relative to uh, mine or anyone else's. Um, and really, I think you have to come up with the implementation that works right for your organization and for your team um, and go with that. Um, and uh, please take the session survey and the app. Uh, but, but any questions? We have, we have time, so. Mm -hmm. How do you reconcile that their access might not match the view? So, it, so, so, yeah, so if I go back to that, um, one of the things is that you really can't, I mean, based on the way this works, you really can't, the, the formula will fail, right, if you don't, if the data that is needed to filter isn't at the row level isn't present. So let's say that I had a data source that did not include program type because it was a it was just a you know sales rep metric report. So well that would actually include. But anyway, um, it didn't include program type. If I try to insert the permissions filter as is, it would fail because program type does not exist as a field in that data source. So so that's that's kind of the first part is that you know you you have to kind of adjust the permissions filter to make it work in the data source that you, that the specific data source you're, you're putting it in. But the other thing is that it's, um, what it's doing is it's doing row level filtering. So all it's dictating is what data gets returned from the server to that user in that session. And so it's not, your filters really shouldn't be affected because your filters are really only filtering on, on columns that are in the data source. And if, if the column isn't in the data source, then then it can't be in the filter, if that makes sense. Sorry, I guess what I mean is, let's say you limit someone to only have access to APAP data. Yeah.
Yes. Oh, uh, we yeah no we've edu yeah we that's and that probably should have been communication but we that's one thing we educated them on is that you're only getting your slice of the data, and so you know if if you've got the APAC marketing manager sitting next to the EMEA marketing manager and they pull up the same report, th it's going to look very different right because and e and if you filter for network they're going to get very different numbers um, and that was an early cause of confusion but once we once we properly explained everyone it's I mean it's just you you get the data you know you get the data you get it's still you know. And it's still somewhat a source of contention. Our, you know, our, our product marketing manager for network wants to be able to see, uh, hey, he's seen a drop in conversion. What about the product marketing manager for systems? And I'm like, well, you know, your desk is like here. Desks are, you can just go talk. Like, I'm not saying you can't talk to each other about the data. I'm just saying you can't have it. Yeah, and th we do a little bit of I mean, this is, um, we do a little bit of the linking. Um, we we do a little bit of linking back and forth. Um, you know, I, it's and again we're and we're we're still early in kind of rolling this specific methodology out. Um, what we tend to do, you know, we we tend our dashboards tend to be we're not a big kind of our organization is not really like kind of big like prototypical dashboard. It's People are, we've got a very data hungry, data comfortable organization in general. Um, not always data competent, but, but at least hungry and aware that they, they need to use it. And so they will, you know, they do an excellent job of going in and, um, you know, they'll, they'll do an excellent job of, of going into a, say, an entire process report and finding what they need. At kind of as they're, they're as a dashboard, but we don't we don't really have true dashboards the way you know I was just in the sales Tableau sharing some of their sales dashboards. I mean they have like true dashboards. We don't we don't do that in quite the same way. Um, so it's it's not really a problem that we have so much. Any other questions? Yeah. So you went straight to a, a, a server. We did. No, we didn't. We didn't just because there wasn't. I mean, that I guess that would have been an improvement over, over just using. Um, that that would have been an improvement over just using Excel. But the thing, you know, distribution is such a problem for us. Um, you know, we had an analyst in we had an analyst in India whose sole job it was every day to open Excel files, hit refresh, and save them again. Right, so I don't I don't want to now transition that person's job to to save Tableau visits and send it to the people with Reader, right? It just you know and you know I was lucky I had I had you know CFO support to spend the money, so why not? <laughs> you had a question? Did you create any sort of steering committee, or how did you prioritize what dashboards went first? Who got the information? Yeah, so we so. We covered the we we had some some leeway to cover it. It wasn't like anyone didn't have critical data they needed. It was more kind of rolling out. Of, you know, it was, it was an improvement to what they to what they already had. Um, we had a lot of leeway to kind of prioritize appropriately. But you know, as you, there's a couple of ex SolarWind sales guys in uh, in the back of the room who are now Tableau sales guys, and they could tell you that um, th there's there's a very clear hierarchy. That it was a no brainer. There's sales. There's marketing. There's everybody else. So we just went along with that. Why, why fight the tide? Hi, I was just wondering in terms of, are you centralized then in terms of this creation? Because you mentioned the matrix organization and 21 desktop users. Are, are those 21 spread out or are you centralized? We're centralized. So we have, I have, of my 17, because uh, we probably have 10 or 12 that are really active Tableau users and creators, and they're doing the majority of the creation for the entire organization. But we do have, um, you know, we have an excellent PMM uh, product marketing manager who's, who's, who could work on my team in a second if that's what he wanted to do. Um, so we just gave him a license. He went to town, and then, and then we stole a bunch of his stuff and then made it available to everybody. We yeah so we what 
what our big objective is, because so our big objective is not, and, and, and frankly, I mean, I know there's different philosophies about it, but I think it's dangerous to find yourself in a place where you have every person in the organization creating a bunch of visualizations and and going in and slicing the data, di- slicing and dicing the data in a bunch of different ways, right? Because uh, you know the, that brings back the risk for multiple versions of the truth that people aren't applying filters the right way. Um, the second issue is that it's, in my mind, is it's, on some level it's a waste of time, right? Let's let's create if if we need a view of, of downloads by source, let's create the best darn visualization on downloads by source that meets as many people's needs as possible and use that. And if there's someone who really wants to see an alternate version, you know what? They can they can have at it using server. Uh, to you know, save as and, and adjust it as they will, but but our goal really, and it's not about to me, it's not about control. Again, we'll give you know a power user a license and let them go to town, um, but they've got to be a power user, right? We don't we don't give those to anybody. Um, but to me, it's about just really having you know having a really high quality report that does that does that job the best any report could do that job. We we do we yeah we tend to focus yeah we have people who focus more on say maintenance renewal reporting someone focuses more on marketing reporting someone focuses on web analytics someone focuses on um, we don't focus we don't break that down by product though our products all behave pretty similarly um, and that's but that is the question is we try to figure out whether we should grow my team um, again because we try to run pretty lean that that is the question of. You know how much, how many groups can one analyst support realistically? Because to really support that group, you have to understand at a at a very detailed level how that group operates. And so it's that's one thing we're battling with. But it's again, and I think you know my bias being an ex consultant is look, you know, dedicate, spend a week with that team, and dedicate two months to building out, you know, the first eighty percent of what they need, and then move on to the next thing. And at some point, we'll circle back to them and give them the rest of what they need. But that's, you know, as we've gone so far, that's been good enough. I don't, I don't know how that will continue to scale. One thing I do know is that if you, if you do not find a way to, you know, control the access or to control the, the, the number of requests you get, you know, people will request reports all day long, right? And one of the things that we, that we are in charge of and that we have to do is say, okay, wait, how are you going to use this? Like, what is this for? Tell me, you know, my, my junior analysts are empowered to ask a senior director, okay, show me how you would actually use this data. Right, because we don't, you know, we're limited on time like anyone else. I'm not going to create something that that either isn't going to be used or that isn't going to have the desired outcome. So we're not order takers. You know, it's it's their it is their job to figure out to to refuse work that that isn't going to get you know the desired objective. I got a little intense. Sorry about that. It's a personal <laughs> personal passion. In terms of just getting the, the server installed and everything? Yeah, to get the right server config and to have the ongoing system administration as far as users. Yeah, so the so we handle within my team, we handle the, the we handle all of the admin that occurs through the through the UI we handle. Yeah. Um, and so one of the one of the guys who's here from SolarWinds is does that and but all of the anything that happens at the server level IT handles and they, they had you know, we, we wrote a check on their behalf and they, they have been good enough to cash it for us. It took a little longer than than I might have hoped, but you know beggars can't be choosers. And then did you guys pursue any uh, tablet certification for desktop or No, no, I don't. I don't know. Maybe we should. That seems to make people marketable. So. <laughs> no, I'd be I'd be fine with it. No one, to be honest, no one's asked. So. All right, are we are we out of time? Oh, okay. One minute. Yes.